Well, if you have your Bibles this morning, turn to Luke's Gospel. We're in the most familiar chapter of Luke's Gospel, Luke 15, and we've come to the most uh, well-known portion of it, the prodigal son. Although, let me say to you this morning, the title of this parable should be The Loving Father. And there's reasons for that. Is One, because uh, the father is the dominant uh, figure within the story. It uh, takes uh, place with three characters, uh, the younger son, the older son, and the father. But the father has the predominant place. And not only that, it's also there in verse 11 for us. And what I'll do, I'll just read from verse 11, and I'll read down uh, to verse then 18, no, verse 19. Just, just one portion of the prodigal uh, son's story, or the loving father. There are three main characters. But what we're going to do this morning is just look at one of those characters. I'll read it to you, and this is why you believe it is the loving father. Then he said, verse 11, a certain man, see, he's the main one. A certain man had two sons. And the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that befalls to me. So he divided to them his livelihood. And not many days after, the younger son gathered all together, joined to a far country, and there wasted his possessions with prodigal living. But when he had spent all, there arose a severe famine in that land, and he began to be in want. And he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country. And he sent him into the fields to feed swine, and he would gladly have filled his stomach with the pods that the swine ate, and no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have bread enough to spare, and I perish with hunger. I will arise and go to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. And he rose and went to his father. But when he was still a great way off, his father saw him, had compassion, and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. Now, just one or two comments before we start on this great parable. It will be our a final uh, Bible studies to the end of the year. Is that when we read this parable, I want you to know that it is about the gospel and the grace of our Lord and Saviour Jesus Christ. It is about the gospel, which is of salvation, reconciliation and acceptance. It's the wonderful gospel that Jesus Christ has come to reveal to us. But I want you to know once again, because that when people speak of the prodigal son, they have certain questions. They have a gospel which is without Christ. They turn to it and they say, well, don't you read the prodigal son? There's nothing of Jesus Christ in that parable. There's nothing about repentance in that parable. And they begin then to make another kind of gospel, which is of the heavenly father, which just receives men and women without ever coming to their senses, without the atoning blood of our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. I need you to look at this just in verse 3. So he spoke this parable to them. We've emphasised it over the weeks. There is three stories. There is one parable in one way. That which is lost, that which is found, that is which is great rejoicing. And as we looked at last week, you need to take the three together. Because when you do, you'll find, first of all, don't separate it, because it begins with a good shepherd who seeks his sheep. 
He's the one who goes into the far country. The good shepherd is the one who lays down his life for the sheep. That's what this gospel is all about. Jesus Christ came into this world to come and seek and to save that which was lost. And then last week, do you remember? There was the woman who then lights a lamp. And we said, is it not possible that in this parable, you've got a wonderful picture of the Holy Spirit, which comes then to shine light upon people who are not just lost, but lost in darkness. And in the third parable, you have there the Heavenly Father, which is looking for the Son to return. God the Father, God the Spirit, God the Son, all there together seeking for the lost. But this morning, I want us to look, although it's all about the Father, I want us to consider for a moment this prodigal son, his journey away from God and his journey then back to God. And it's filled with revelation for us. And you find it there in verse 12, for example, and it says that the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that befalls me. And that is the very first indication of where people are in this world before God. Although they may live in God's world, they live in God's house, they live, you see, in the place that belongs to him, yet as it tells us in 1 Colossians uh, chapter 1, that in our minds we're alienated from him. And the prodigal son was a prodigal son long before he left home. He was someone who lived in the home, but he was estranged from his father. I don't want to go into all the details, but it's an awful thing to say. Uh, divide the portion of my inheritance with me. It's been mentioned many times, is that the prodigal son then comes. And what he asks is this. I'm not saying that he perhaps wished that he then was dead, that he would then simply have his goods. Now, I don't want to shock you, but it does happen. There have been many who have waited uh, for a family member to pass away because they want then simply the goods. And so it was that when the son came to the father, the father had two sons and he loved them both. There's nothing about this father in any way that tells us he was bad or unkind. But the reality is this, that in people's minds, there is the enmity which is against the heavenly father. And what we would rather in our lives, is it not this, is that every one of us would want to feed off him, have his goods, enjoy what he gives, those things which are around us, but without the father himself. That is the first step of a person's journey away from God. It's the step where we want to live independently of him. Give me the goods and my inheritance. And perhaps it was that what took place then is that the family estate and the farm would have to be divided. And so it was then that perhaps the younger son had his portion of that family estate where he could milk his own cows and raise then his cattle and then he could live in his own means without referring and the relationship to the father. But that's not only the one step. But there are people like that this day. They may live in the house of God, but in their hearts they're far from him. But what you find now, you see, in verse then uh, 13, is uh, this, is that not many days after, the younger son gathered together and journeyed to a far country. And the second step that takes place in this alienation from God is that now you see there came the moment that perhaps he sells his portion and he moves as far as he can from the very things of his father. Now those are the days without live stream, without phones, without uh, any correspondence and this son was literally going and on that moment, his father would never see him ever again. The relationship is as far and as wide 
as it could possibly be. And I want you to know that when you're listening to this parable at this time, you see Jesus is speaking to two types of people. You find it there in verse 1. Then all the tax collectors and the sinners draw near to hear him. Verse 2, and the Pharisees and the scribes complained, saying, this man receives sinners and eats with them. And the Lord Jesus, when he speaks this parable, don't think for a moment if you were the tax collector or you were the sinner, that you could then point your finger in your, in your way to the Pharisee and to the scribe, because Jesus is touching the nerve as he begins to tell them how they now left for their money, for their possessions, for the things that they want in this life to live for without God. And they've gone far from God. That's these people. They know what it is to have now gone to a place where they're no longer received in the house of God. They're no longer accepted amongst the people of God. They're no longer now welcome, you know, in the land of God. They have, they've moved far from him. It's like that. Remember that in your life. Please remember that even with your uh, children, teenagers especially. They long, don't they, to leave home. They want to live independently. And I've known of those who have brought up loving parents whose children have gone far away. But I want you to know this. It's not because that the father did anything wrong. It's not because these parents themselves did anything wrong. But you know, there's in the heart of people who've been brought up in Christian homes to move far from God. That's the thing. Far from the knowledge of him. Far from the experience of him. Far from the place where they came to worship him. Far from the place where they say their grace over dinner. Far from the place where prayers are made. Far from those Christians that they knew. Far from this Lord's day in which they honoured. And so it is that this man now, he comes, the young lad, goes as far from the Heavenly Father or from his father as he possibly could. But it's not the end of his declension away from God. Because in verse 13, just notice the step. And they, they wasted his possessions with prodigal living. Just this story which Jesus unfolds with the living. The sinners are before him. And as those sinners are before him, what you find is this. Is that uh, you find that there's just this life which as we read there, wasted, wasted. And people waste their lives. Every life which is from God is wasted. And uh, there are those who have wasted their talents, their gifts, their possessions, their inheritance. They've wasted it all. I could give you so many examples of wasted life. I wouldn't know where to begin, but it goes something like Boris Becker. What a gift he had. Three times Wimbledon champion. This year he watched it from jail. And you say, well, what did he did? Well, he simply just enjoyed life, enjoyed women, enjoyed the fame. Enjoyed the fast cars, enjoyed those things. There are people who have had an inheritance and you know that they have found themselves wasted. People in politics who have then thrown it away. Uh, you think of these things, don't you? Look, let me just say to you, you don't have to be someone great or someone special. There'll be those this day wasting their precious time. What have you done today? I, I've wasted it. Dragged myself around, lounged here, done that. The things of their days, they come to the end of the day. Nothing for God, nothing achieved for God. Comes to the end of the week, 
comes to the end of the year, nothing to show for it. Comes to the end of a life, a life, you see, which is out God, and it is wasted. There will be those there. All sinners came to him. And from different backgrounds and different places, women who had given their lives to men. They will be men who have taken of their inheritance and now they've got nothing to show for it. And the Lord Jesus Christ and those which had gifts and abilities have now nothing to show. And Jesus comes and he uh, reveals these things. Not only that, it gets worse because in verse 14, and when he had spent all, there arose a great famine in the land and he began to be in want. I'm just showing you the picture of the prodigal person who does then go from God. And one of the things that you find that when you go far from God into another land, to another country, you'll come to a place where there is not anything, anything that will satisfy you. A famine came into the land, a severe famine. He had given himself now, he, he was in want. It's that very story of what happens in people's lives. And it's this, they find themselves that there's not anything that they could purchase or have that satisfies and feeds them in any shape or form. And they're hungry, hungry for happiness, hungry for meaning, hungry for joy. I know it's only a story, but people, I assure you, are hungry. And as you know of the song from the Rolling Stones, by no stretch of the imagination, Christians, one can get no satisfaction. And it happens like that. No matter who you are, when you live from God, I remember reading in the newspaper many years ago, i just say about, uh, say, six or seven before COVID, there was this couple, they did well in their lives. You're going to get tired of it. You get tired of your holidays, tired of your gallivanting, tired of your son, tired of your car, tired of your good little pleasure. You get tired of it. And it does nothing for your soul. This couple... They did well in business. They had uh, both achieved. They must have been high achievers. They had a little company, became millionaires and multimillionaires. And just they retired, as you can, if you do well, in their 50s, you know, to enjoy. I'm not sure how many times they've gone around the world. It may have been the third world cruise they were on. And they said in the paper that what they did was they walked off the side of the boat because there was nothing else was there you've seen it you've just come to be in want and nothing can satisfy your soul it's a wasted life your days are precious look it's not the end of the story because it goes worse again and verse 15 he then went and joined himself to the citizen of that country and he sent him into the fields to feed swine. And now he's part, can you imagine it? Here are these tax collectors joined to the Roman government and soldiers and they've been given this job to collect all this wealth but at the end of the day it was the worst job and you feel and you know what it is that you're unclean. And now this man's with the pigs and he finds himself in the pigsty and uh, it tells us in that verse he would gladly have filled his stomach with the pods. As one old Negro spiritual preacher put it like this, he danced the togs, he fed the hogs and he ate the pods. He came to that, did he not? And that very place where he is now utterly unclean and starving and dirty. And look in verse 16 and please note it. 
when you come as the prodigal son does. And there was no one who gave him anything. No one could help. No one was there. No one was of any comfort or any assistance. And so it is in this world. Please realize this today. When this world is far from God, this world now is turned from him, the day in which we live, there is no one who can help you. Any society, any government, any party, any thinking, any education, no one can help in that state. That's the, the downward decline of the prodigal. I'm just saying to you this morning, See, this book reads us, knows us, the end between our minds, the independence that we want to live, moving as far from him as we possibly can, the emptiness within our soul, the degradation, the places that we found ourselves in sin, stinking like the hogs in a sty. And there's no one that can get us out of that filth. It's not the story, remember, of the prodigal son, but I need you to show how far he goes that you appreciate of where the father takes him. Then you've got this wonderful, they talk about the buts of the Bible. And then you find his return. And here it is in verse 17. But when he came to himself, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have enough bread, enough, and to spare, and I perish with hunger. I want you to look at that but. But in that state, it's one of the first ways that a person comes back to God. He, he comes back to God, as one version puts it, when he came to his senses, when he came to his right mind. Because of all that he had been doing was not of a right and a sane mind. I don't know if you remember years ago, I think it was our first uh, Minister of Wales, forget his name, Ron Davis. And he goes and wrecks his political career on some kind of night out in London. And when he was caught, he said that what he did was this. It was a moment of madness. That's how he claimed it. A moment of madness. And you know that, don't you? You say, and you look at people, you say to them, what were you thinking? You threw it all away. Family and friends and business. Are you in your right mind? Is there something wrong with you? And so it happened that in this place of the prodigal son, when he had lost all his faculties, that when he came to his senses, and his senses were this, just begins to think of, of first of all, it's interesting what he does think of, the father's house. Well, actually, he doesn't even think of his father. Remember now, he's estranged from him. Doesn't think, but he does remember this. In his father's house, the servants of his father, hired servants, they ate bread. They're not hungry. They have enough to spare. And there's more than enough in my father's house for bread to eat. And he begins to think. There must be something for me. If I were to just return. And just to think of the father. In that house. They're satisfied. People are not hungry. Even the servants themselves. I'm in this place. And what happens, you see, in the world is like this. It, it is a realization. You go into the world and the world will treat you 
And you'll find the treatment of the world is without mercy or kindness. No one will help you. But in the Father's house, there is plenty. And not only that, I, I want you to, to think now, which he says uh, there in these very uh, verses. Let's have a look. Um, I will arise. I'm looking at it. I will arise. The Father's house is enough to spare. No, verse 17. Don't forget that last line. I perish with hunger. That's another point of coming to his senses. A person begins to realise that if I were to stay here, I'm going to die. I'm going to perish. That, that's my lot. I was only listening to the news of someone this morning who got taken up in a gambling addiction, ended up in jail, and uh, they said, well, what happened? They said, all I realised was this. Unless I stopped, it was all going to end. My life was going to end. And so it is when God brings a person back to themselves. Now, you must take it that, that God's Holy Spirit shines upon them. The darkness they're in, the plight they are, the difficulty of the situation, the goodness of the Father, and that one day they will perish. When you're complaining the gospel and teaching people the gospel, don't ever underestimate the self-preservation of human beings who want to live. You say, do you have any connection with the world out there to the gospel in which we live? Richard Baxter says, yes, begin with this. There are people who are so self-centered, they want something for themselves. They want to live. Begin there. Tell them that. Tell them that they start here. There is a place they will perish. And so he comes. He begins to think that uh, the state he's in. And he begins to think of uh, the, the difficulties and where he will end. The second point of his return. I will arise and go to my father and say to him, there is something else that takes place in this return. Is that now he not just thinks about it, but he, he speaks to himself and it's, it's what he actually, he will do. Now, when a person begins to come back uh, to a place where they have removed from, it's also a place, do you not understand, where there's a step which is taken where people are returning. And although they may not have returned to God, they return to the place where they remember that they knew something of goodness, of purity, of kindness, and they begin to return. It is that form of repentance, of repentance. And notice now of this repentance, it's, it's very interesting. Because he says, I will say to him, listen now, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. Do you remember on Sunday night we looked at that confession of David? And when he was caught out, what was the first thing that he said? Against you, God, and you only have I sinned. And this man now is actually mentioning, believe it or not, the one word we're not allowed to mention in church today. Sin. I've sinned. I'm a sinner. And in the return, what happens is that this man now says, what I've done is against heaven itself in the way that I have responded and treated and the things that I've been. Here are all the sinners around him. Sinners come to him. And sinners have to admit their guilt to him. And I've also sinned against you. 
against you. It is the return which uh, he gives. I want you to, to look that that's uh, part of this return. Now, he hasn't really understood it all. He doesn't really understand the gospel. He doesn't know the heart of his father. He hasn't got the insight of how he'll be received. All he's thinking about is this. I need bread to live. If I stay here, I perish. I need to go to him, confess that I've done wrong. I have sinned and I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. Now, as I'm going to show you that this man doesn't get it, but he gets just enough that is willing to return. He doesn't realize that the father is willing to receive him as his child and as his son. But he only wants to be a hired servant. People come back to God like that. They, they, they don't realize the nature of grace, the freeness of it. It doesn't matter if you don't understand it all. It doesn't matter if people don't have fully grasp it. All they need, first of all, is that they know enough that they need to come to him. Now look, I'm just highlighting these points because this shows us the nature of the gospel. Jesus uh, is not dealing with people who have made a success of their lives. The gospel is not for people who have wandered off and come back and said, well, I haven't been too bad. The gospel of Jesus Christ is not about people who have, who have just lived these perfect lives. It's the gospel of this incredible grace of God, which then he has willing to accept. I'm not going to go into it, but you know it there. The Father was ready to receive him.